It's a breakthrough in an end-time prophetic move. Now, I don't know where you stand on end-time prophecy, but you know Jesus is coming back. Amen? Do you know why he's coming back and when he's coming back? Well, when you read your Bibles and you see in Matthew 23, 37 through 39, he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who stoned the prophets and rejected the one sent to you. Like a mother hen longs to gather her chicks, how I long to gather you back to me, but you were not willing. O Jerusalem, you will not see me again until you cry out, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So the Jewish people have to come to faith. Something has to happen to bring the Word of God to our Jewish people that they might usher in the return of Messiah. And this is a part of this work. You see, you're making a difference tonight. When you read in your Bibles that Jew and Gentile become one in Messiah, that's exactly what's happening tonight because we are all one in Messiah, amen? I've got to tell you the truth because it says the Word of God, the truth will set you free, amen? How many of you know that your victory is because of the shed blood of Messiah? How many of you know that you bear the mark of the Messiah and the enemy looks at you and he cannot have you? You are redeemed, you are sealed by the blood of the Lamb. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. It was not access to the kingdom of heaven. For the Jew, it was not access for the kingdom of heaven. For the Gentile, it was access for the kingdom of heaven. For all to receive the Lamb of God. There's uh, renewed tensions between Israel and Russia. We talked in the last couple of weeks about Israel and Jordan signing a deal for gas. But there was a survey that was just done of the average Jordanian, and they hate Israel. The average Jordanian, they've, been, they've had a peace agreement with Israel for 24 years. And the average Jord Jordanian interviewed hates Israel, hates the Jews. This was a point we bring out on the program, that there is... No animus between Jewish people and Arabs. It's a one-sided hatred. It's an absolutely one-sided hatred. There's not a Jew that I know that hates Arabs. We don't hate Egyptians. We don't hate Syrians. We don't hate the Lebanese. We don't hate anybody. We're not a hating people. It's not our nature to hate. It's not our nature to take lives. It's not our nature to overrun somebody or rob them of their identity. We've certainly been trying to be robbed of our identity for thousands of years. So why would we do that to somebody else? We don't like it. Why would we commit genocide? We didn't like it. It doesn't make sense. So these accusations that come out against the Jews' hatred towards the Arabs, the Bible doesn't say that. It says Esau and his descendants, Ishmael and his descendants, they're the ones that will hate and try to annihilate. So this is a basic tenet of Islam. It's one we expose today. So Russia has a fairly large Islamic population, about 20%. If you look across their nation, it's a pretty large country. Right? Russia's large, but so are all the other, the former Soviet Union. It's pretty large. We did a uh, special yesterday with... Um, uh, what was her first name? It was Lu, Luena, was that what the name? Cinquanta from North India. She was up on the Ganges River. And she talked about the believing population of North India. When she got there 20 years ago, it was 0.05%. And now it's 2%, which out of 1.2 billion people is a lot of people. That's incredible growth. But Compassion International was just kicked out of India. 
they shut down operations on Friday. And she went on record as saying that it was because of accounting errors, that they target Christian ministries, they accuse them of trying to force people to convert, and then they look for accounting errors. So it's a compounding of problems. Now in the community she's in, there's 30,000 disenfranchised orphans and impoverished children, and there's three children's homes. That's it, for 30 million children. Right there on the Ganges River, which is where those crocodiles are and all that, uh, the um, drownings and the babies being abandoned. And it's horrendous. And it's because they're that close to Nepal, they're that close to China, they're that close to Afghanistan. You don't really realize where North India borders and all of the influences of all the gods that Hindu has. And so you realize this is the darkest place in the world. Absolutely the darkest place in the world. And she's there pretty much by herself ministering the gospel. She's planted 10,000 churches in 20 years. It's extraordinary. The ministry is called Tell Asia, T-E-L-L, Asia. Tell Asia. Tell Asia about the good news. So she's one of those people we talked about that there's only one missionary for every one million Muslims. You think about how many missionaries there are for the Hindu population. Now in South India, it's prosperous. It's the Silicon Valley of India. But in North India, it's an abandoned, forgotten community. And the capital is not far from there, New Delhi. But they've abandoned the northern tier. So what happens? They're left alone. 30 million children in this region. And there's no humanitarian aid coming in there because the Indian government is pro-Hindu. It's a Hindu party. So they don't want other religions in there. They don't want people converting to Christianity. They don't want the gospel message preached. And 80% Hindu, 20% Muslim in India. So when we take a look at what's going on in the world, Asia, Africa, and Europe, it's a whole different climate than America. And we don't get those feeds. We don't look at that information. You're not getting those reports unless you subscribe to mission reports from various mission groups and subscribe to ministries like Tel Asia, you don't hear anything about this problem. But it's the great omission again. It's everybody but the Muslims, everybody but the Hindus, and everybody but the Jews. So all of a sudden you're in this really finite area of who do you go to to preach the gospel? Well, we go to Central and South America. We go to Tanzania, right? We go to parts of Africa. What's that? They need it too. That's right. So when we look at this, we find that we struggle in the mission field. Catholic Church is still planting, but is that the gospel message? You have to decide for yourself. I know Catholics that are spirit-filled Catholics, and so you can't say that anybody who's a Catholic is not a believer. You can't paint with that broad a brush. It's like saying that anybody who's Jewish is not a believer. I'm Jewish. Paul was Jewish. Writers of the New Testament were Jewish. They were all were believers. So when we look at the conditions of the world, we're seeing that there's factions, there's wars, there's rumors of wars, there's rebellions, a revolt. Look what's happening in Afghanistan. And we pulled out of there. Everybody else pulled out of there. And 15 years later, it's worse than it was before. We've got 10,000 troops in Mosul, ready to have Mosul fall back into the hands of the Iraqis. The minute that ISIS leaves Mosul, we'll send 5,000 troops on the ground to Syria to follow ISIS into Syria. How many of you know that Israel did a bombing run in Damascus last week? Syria said, we're going to retaliate. So Israel bombed them again. And we talked about that. We talked about taking Isaiah 17 out of context. It's not just about Damascus, it's, all, it's about the entire region. So when we look at this and we understand that all of this is biblical, all of this is coming to pass. Now, Russia, because of their alliance with Turkey and Iran, has to make a choice. Are they going to be a friend of Israel? Are they going to be a friend of Turkey and Iran? Are they going to be a friend of, of arming Hezbollah? 
And we're going to talk about Hezbollah tonight if we get through all the material because Hezbollah is planning on an attack on Israel. This is the proxy state for Iran. And one of the things that Israel does, which is completely different than America, is they tell you the day before they're going to bomb Damascus, that they're going to bomb Damascus. We're putting together the IAF, they're going to be on a bombing run in Damascus tomorrow. We're not going to be threatened by Syria, so we're going to take action, and we just want to let you know. So the next day comes, and they bomb Syria, and Syria goes, well, you've attacked us. Well, we told you yesterday we were coming. So Syria reports that they shot down an Israeli Air Force plane. They didn't. But this is the kind of press that they want to have. So what goes out over the Islamic television stations? Propaganda. We're winning the war. So the Taliban, what do they do? You heard about the Taliban today. They blew up six intelligence workers in Afghanistan took a car bomb and the Taliban took credit for it. So when's the last time you heard about the Taliban? I thought we were told they were gone. Al Qaeda was gone. Al Jolson's gone but Al Qaeda's doing just fine, thank you. So when we look at this we find out that America does the same thing. We're propagandizing in America what we've accomplished in the Middle East. So now Muhammad Abbas is coming to America. He's all excited because Donald Trump will listen to a two-state solution, according to him. So he's the president of Fatah, which is the former PLO, that has training grounds in Ramallah, has training grounds all over in Jericho and all over the region. But they also have Christian communities all over his region. Ramallah is a Christian city, but they have Muslim training camp. Why? Because unless he continues to flex and to show that they have some kind of army put together, as ragtag as it is, then how can he say, how can he threaten Israel? Well, we're going to threaten you. He doesn't control Gaza. Hamas controls Gaza. But the people in Gaza have said, if we can have elections in Gaza, we would not re-elect them. We would put Fatah in. We would have Abbas as our president, not Hamas. So Hamas says, well, you can't have elections. So there you have it. It's a stalemate. The people want an election. Hamas is in power. They were voted into power. They chose not to come under Fatah. But now, because they're disenfranchised, they're cut off. And today they find out that uh, humanitarian aid going to Turkey was rerouted to back Hamas. This is the kind of stuff that goes on. It's a very corrupt world. But what do we hear? We hear that this country sent humanitarian aid to Turkey. Well, guess what? It wound up in Gaza and in a munitions factory to make more missiles to fire into southern Israel. So it's, an ever, it's, it's constantly sparking, constantly fueling, constantly moving towards some semblance of peace and war and peace and war and peace and war. This is why we go during Ramadan. They fast all day. They don't want to fight. They're hungry. They, they can't wait for the third call to prayer so they can go eat. And then they party all night. And they're up all night partying. And they're tired in the morning. And they've got to go to work on an empty stomach. And they, you know, they don't drink alcohol. But whatever they do, they do something. I can't really explain it to you. It's in a hookah. And I don't know what's in that hookah that they sit around and they smoke. And I have no idea what's in it. And I'll tell you, no, 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 we don't take drugs. We don't take drugs. But if you listen to the interview today, a shaheed, somebody who is being trained to be a terrorist, is not bound by Sharia. They can take drugs, they can drink alcohol, they can convert, they can go to Las Vegas and gamble, they can do whatever they want because they're destined for heaven, for paradise. So they're considered differently. Sharia doesn't apply to them. They're above the law. So if I claim that I'm going to be a shaheed, I'm going to blow myself up one day. You know, there's a lot of uh, former 
alleged PLO terrorists out there that said, oh yes, I fled from Israel, from Gaza, from <clears throat> all over Israel because I was, uh, I was a terrorist, but I changed my name because, you know, there's a bounty on my head. It's interesting because Nani Darwish confessed that there's a bounty on her head in any Islamic nation, that she would be beheaded and stoned, not just one or the other, but both. In every Muslim country in the world, there's a bounty on her head. To Sir Abu Saida. His name said in a whisper. He's still a man of great respect, but he goes to Israel all the time. In the same place that he was assassinating people. Well, he's come to faith. He's made recompense with Israel. He's not a wanted man in Israel. He's a wanted man in Jordan. Why didn't he change his name? Would you think that somebody like that, who was Arafat's sniper, who's in the history books, would change his name for his protection? He doesn't care. He said, if God wants to take me, he'll take me. God wants me to go to Israel and build schools, I'll go to Israel and build schools. If somebody comes after me, then somebody comes after me. What do, I can't be concerned with those kind of things. Why should I change my name? I'm proud of my name. It's a family name. It's a name that's respected in Israel. Why change it? So there's there's dynamics going on that are prophetic, that have a direct impact on what affects the region and what affects us. And so you have Tillerson out there that today says, I'm not going to the NATO meeting, but we're all behind NATO. America's not all behind NATO. This is our statement to the world that we're 100% convinced that NATO is the right place for us. You know, France is about to have elections. What are they going to do? They're going to have a new president. Okay? One's anti-Muslim. One is more of a populist or a pluralist kind of candidate that says we can't discriminate against people because of their faith. I'm here to tell you, Islam is not a faith. It's not a religion. It's an ideology. It's a complete difference. And every time America talks about a religious test at our borders, they're applying it to the wrong people because Islam is an ideology. It is not a religion. It comes with a civil code. Anything that comes with a civil code, a set of laws which require punishment, death, imprisonment, beatings, stonings, beheadings, is not a religion. It's a very interesting statement that she made, is that everything in the Koran compares Islam to everybody else. It's a comparative ideology that all these other religions are false, were true. It's a comparison. Why can't you stand on your own? This was her question. Why can't it stand on its own? Why does it have to compare itself to everybody else? When they say Allahu Akbar, what have you been taught that that means? God is great. Isn't that what you hear on the news? It's not what it means. It means Allah is greater. It's all comparative. It's all relative. It's all drawing comparison between the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and saying that Allah is greater. But you don't hear that reported. Why? Because that would advance awareness and education. I put the video from today's interview and I put on there, you have been warned America by a Muslim who came to America in 1979, came to faith in the early 80s and has been a vocal person for the faith and said, I chose Christian values over Islamic values. That's the subtitle of her book. Holy Different is what it's called. W-H-O-L-L-Y, but uh, W-H-O-L-Y, holy with a W, because she's holy, different holy. But this is what's going on in the Middle East. This is what's going on in America. We're still fighting this religious test because people have been convinced that Islam's a religion. It's not a religion. It's an ideology. It's contrary. It's the counterfeit of Christianity. It's a counterfeit of faith. Everything has a punishment. And it's only for men. Only men go to heaven. Women go to hell. Do you know that in Islam? Women don't get to go to paradise. The only way you can go to paradise is if your husband, your son is a shaheed and goes before Allah and ask Allah permission 
to bring your family when they die to paradise. Doesn't this sound like an intercessor? Doesn't this sound like no one comes to the Father but through the terrorist? No one comes to the Father but through a Shahid, somebody who's been martyred. Is that scripture? Is that what we believe? Nobody comes to, unless you're a suicide bomber, nobody comes to the Father but the suicide bomber. If you see this counterfeit, every point, counterpoint, truth, untruth, all back and forth between the Quran and between the Bible, 600 years after Jesus, that's how long I had to come up with this whole plan. And then somebody falls asleep, kind of like John Smith falls asleep. And all of a sudden you have Mormons. Okay? Another guy falls asleep and all of a sudden you have Islam. I'm going to go to sleep tonight and when I wake up tomorrow, I think I'll come with a, uh, what do you think? Jason, what should we call it? You could be a high priest. I'll be the poobah. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Father God, we come to you on bended knee, Father God. We come to you in the name of Jesus, the name above all names, Lord. And we ask you, Father God, to move by your spirit in this place, to touch us, to give us ears, ears to hear and a heart to receive, a greater touch of understanding that we would not be lured into this false gospel, to this false teaching, to this false understanding, Father, but we would bend and bow to your will and to your word, Father, and that we would hold on to the promises of your word. And so, Father, we dedicate this time to you in the name of Jesus and give you all the praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, six reasons why Gog is the Antichrist. This is from our good friend Joel Richardson. Now, how many of you have drawn the conclusion that Gog of Magog is also the Antichrist? Have you thought about that? Have you heard about that? Okay. This is a great defense for this. And it's an examination of Ezekiel 38 and 39 in a way you have not examined it before. You remember when we did Daniel? And I took you through the six specific things that God said he was going to do in Daniel. You know, he does that in Ezekiel 38 and 39. But we tend to read through things and not stop and see each one of these as a separate and distinct and try to understand what that means. And so we're going to do that tonight. For years, students of Bible prophecy have been taught that Gog, spoken of in Ezekiel 38 and 39, cannot be the same as the Antichrist or beast spoken of in the New Testament. Among the reasons set forth to argue that the two cannot be the same, none carry any weight. In fact, any examination of the text will establish the two are, in fact, one and the same individual. If this is the case, however, this changes everything within the world of popular biblical prophecy. If it can be shown that Gog is the Antichrist or beast, then it's also clear that the Antichrist and his armies are from the Middle East and not Europe as is properly taught. Now, where is Moscow? What country is Moscow? What, what continent is Moscow in? Asia. Moscow. Moscow is what country? What continent? Asia. It's in Europe. It's in Europe. No. <laughs> I'll look at it. Okay. Okay, there's parts of the former Soviet Union that are in Asia. Okay. But take a look at Moscow. Okay. Could be wrong. We'll look it up now. All right. Could be wrong. But my history professor from University of Alabama last night told me it was Europe. You said it was Europe. Okay. But check it out. See where it is. Now, the belief was is that it would be north of Jerusalem. He believes that the Antichrist is going to come out of the Islamic world, okay, the Middle East. Okay, is there a part of the Middle East which is north of Jerusalem? You can't get to Russia until you get through who? Who? From Jerusalem. What's that? You've got to look at the map, buddy. Okay, these are questions I'm giving you. I'm not giving you answers. Okay. You all have the ability to look it up. What's north of Jerusalem? Drive in your car and go due north. What do you have to go through? It's Europe. Europe. Moscow's in Europe. Are you shocked? Yes. Are you amazed? Right. So this teaching was is that, that this was going to be Europe. And so first there was a thought of Rome. Then everybody moved toward this Gog of Magog was Vladimir Putin because Moscow was due north of Jerusalem and was in Europe. 
See, it still fits the, the model. Right? But what he's saying is not. And he gives you the reasons for it. And so I'm neither going to defend Joel nor am I going to uh, argue against him. The same way when we had him on the program and he said Mystery Babylon was Mecca. And he built his case for the largest gathering of Muslims in the world is at the Hajj. This is the annual pilgrimage that once in a lifetime every Muslim is supposed to make pilgrimage to Mecca. And he talks about it being the Islamic capital of the world in Saudi Arabia and why that's an important strategic part. And he argues in his book, Mystery Babylon, that it's Mecca. Okay? Now, I believe I can argue that Babylon's Babylon, and that's the headquarters of the Antichrist. And he and I will discuss it the same way Carl Gallops and I discussed and argued biblically with great respect and love for each other, not like the guy that we had. Who do we have, Jason? It was uh, Monday morning, the historical guy, the hysterical guy. Edward uh, Simmons. Simmons. Anybody watch that program? I spanked him pretty hard. You know, I should probably call him and apologize, but I told him I was going to do it. I told him 15 minutes before the show what I was going to do, and I prepared him for it, and I told him that I was going to refute his historical worldview, and I was going to give him a biblical worldview. And one of the questions I asked him was, so when you studied the Hebrew, and you found out about the Big Bang Theory, and you refuted creation. He goes, oh, I never studied the Hebrew. I said, so you read the Bible in English, and you call yourself a historian? I said, what if I told you the entire gospel message was contained in Genesis 5.29, in ten names, from Adam to Noah? He said, what are you talking about? I said, well, let me explain it to you. And so I explained it to him. Man will suffer mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down, teaching that his death will bring the despairing rest. He said, where's that? I said, Genesis 5, 29. That's what the names mean. Oh, I didn't know that. I never heard that before. He's a historian. PhD in history from Vanderbilt. So I wasn't, I was, I was gentle. Okay, it was like a mink whip. Okay. <laughs> it's a concept. Okay. So, let's take a look at this. All right. More importantly, it means that until Jesus returns, Islam's not going away. You know, there's a whole theology out there that Islam goes away. Islam is defeated. Islam is crushed. Islam is gone. But that's not true. If you take a look at Egypt, Egypt was scattered, right? Okay. Then they're brought back. Are they brought back as Jews? Are they brought back as Christians? Are they brought back as what? They're non-believers. And so God specifically calls them out in Zechariah 14 and says that they will be required to make pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Why? Because they're not believers. The nations are not believers. So what, if they're not believers, what are they? Well, they must be something else. It's like when the Jews were scattered from Israel, what were they in the nations? They were Jews. So if the Muslims are scattered to the nations, what will they be in the nations? Muslims. So this notion that Islam goes away is not supported in the Bible. If the campaign of Armageddon, what does it do? Are there no survivors? Yes, there's survivors. So... <clears throat> What then are some of the reasons to view Gog and the Antichrist beast as one the same character? The answer lies in the specific results of the destruction of Gog and his armies as detailed within the scriptures. When we turn to Ezekiel 30 and 39, we find that as a direct result of the destruction of Gog and his armies, the following six events take place. First, God's name will never again be profaned, Ezekiel 39, 7. Well, think of that. Isn't God's name profaned when they call God Allah? Isn't that a profanity? Or the Hindus pray to all their gods. And uh, we just heard from Seth. The woods were on fire behind the house, but we got it under control. So they got it under control. They had a forest fire in their backyard. So God's never again, his name will never again be profaned. He said, I will send fire on 
Magog and on those who live in safety in the coastlands, and they will know that I am the Lord. I will make known my holy name among my people Israel. I will no longer let my holy name be profaned. And the nations will know that I, the Lord, am the Holy One of Israel. In Israel. It is coming. It will surely take place, declares the Sovereign Lord. This is the day I have spoken of. This is 39.6 before. 39.8 afterwards. This is the complete thought that God's name will never be profaned again. Well, how does that happen? How could it be said that from that day forward, the Lord will no longer let his holy name be profaned? Literally, right before the Antichrist, his worldwide movement of blasphemy erupt throughout the earth. Not only will this make the Lord a liar, but also impotent. Clearly, when the Lord says his name will no longer be profaned or blasphemed, it speaks of the time when the Antichrist and his blasphemous hordes are silenced at the end of his brief reign of arrogance and profanity. Ezekiel 39, 6 and 7. The surviving Gentile nations will come to a saving knowledge of God. In keeping with the Lord's many promises to someday bring the many Gentile nations of the earth fully to himself, Isaiah 11, 9, Isaiah 16, 14, and Psalm 22, 27, as a reduct, direct result of Gog and his armies, the Lord says, the nations shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Some have attempted to diminish the significance of the statement, treating it as a shallow intellectual acknowledgement of God. How can it be said that the nations will come to know and acknowledge the Lord God, the Holy One in Israel, as the one and only true God at a time immediately before they all come together to blaspheme his name, invade his land, and kill his people? See, they're trying to put this at the beginning, before the tribulation. It can't be before the tribulation. It has to be afterwards. It has to be after his name is blasphemed. It has to be when Jesus comes back and defeats it has to be at the end of the seven years. It can't be at the before the seven years. It can't be at the midpoint of the seven years when it, God's name is blasphemed in Jerusalem when the Antichrist sets up a, a statue of himself and declares he's God. Would that not be blasphemous? Therefore, it can't occur before this time. It has to occur after that time. Now, when we look at Zechariah 14, this pilgrimage, you think about the end result of this pilgrimage to Jerusalem. You have to come to Jerusalem to see who? Jesus. Didn't you all have a personal encounter with Jesus at some point in your life to come to faith? Isn't this how you come to faith? You come face to face with the Messiah. You can't deny him. Nobody ever said, yes, I had an encounter with Jesus. And I said, you know, this is not for me. Have you ever heard that testimony? Yeah, I was walking in the wilderness and I uh, had a vision and Jesus was right there in front of me and said, uh, I came to save you. And I said, you know what? I don't need saving. No, thanks. It's, you know, catch me on the other side. Catch me on the way back. You've never heard a testimony like that. So God orchestrates it so everybody has an encounter with the Messiah. For a thousand years they have this encounter. Every year they have to make pilgrimage to Jerusalem until everybody comes to faith. So, the captives of Israel will be delivered, Ezekiel 39, 25 to 28. After the destruction of Gog and his armies, those Jews who were previously held captive among the Gentile nations will all be delivered, every single one of them. We've talked about this before. This is how all of Israel gets saved. So according to the text, every living Jew will return to the land of Israel. There's simply no way that this event could be placed just before the time when Jesus said many would fall by the sword and would be taken as prisoners to all the nations in Luke 21, 24. So you have to look at when these things occur. And they occur simultaneous to the seven-year reign of the Antichrist. Zechariah says that half of the city of Jerusalem will be exiled in 14.2. So when God says that not a single Jewish captive will remain in exile anymore, they all will be returned from that day forward. This can only be a reference to the time when Jesus returns and delivers the Jewish captives from among the Gentile nations. See, we're dispersed because it's not safe to be in Israel. Why? Because the Antichrist is in Jerusalem. He's mobilized his army. So where do we flee? We flee to the mountains. We flee to the south. We flee to the hills. We go to the nations where we're held captive. If there's a war in Israel where they close the borders for Jews to come in there, they will. They will stop immigration until the war is resolved. It means I'll be staying here in America until the borders open up again and it's safe to return. So during armed conflict, okay, Aliyah is usually temporarily suspended. 
They don't want to settle new families in a war zone or in a battle zone. It's not safe. And especially you're flying into Tel Aviv, which is a city that will, all the way up the coast, be attacked. So this is the strategy. This is the plan. Then he says in Ezekiel 39, 29, God will pour out his spirit on Israel. Not only will the Lord deliver the Jewish captives from among the nations, but he also promises to pour his spirit on them. Again, this occurs immediately after the destruction of Gog and his hordes, a parallel passage found in Isaiah, who says in Isaiah 59, 19, and 20, a redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, declares the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit which is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your offspring, nor the mouth of your offspring's offspring. So that's my child and my grandchild. Says the Lord from now and forever. So in very similar language, other prophets also spoke of this final outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the Jewish people in the context of the return of Messiah. You know, it's in Joel. You know, it's in Micah. It's all over the Bible. Any claim that the grand outpouring of the Spirit of God in Israel precedes the coming of the Antichrist results in prophecy chaos. The only way that this event can be reconciled with the Scriptures is if it occurs at the end of the Great Tribulation when Messiah returns. I can bring the Jews back to Israel to watch the temple be defiled. Then Isaiah 39, um, I'm sorry, Ezekiel 39, 22, the survivors of Israel come to know the Lord forevermore. In accordance with the Lord pouring out his Holy Spirit on the whole house of Israel, Ezekiel also states that after the destruction of Gog and his hordes, the long-awaited national salvation and redemption of all of Israel will finally take place. John the Apostle spoke of what it means to know the Lord. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent, John 17, 3. Any claim that the national salvation of Israel, the coming to know the Lord forevermore from that day forward, takes place before the return of Messiah is not possible. And we've talked about this consistently all the way through, that Paul had this revelation that all of Israel would be saved. That if their transgression meant life for the Gentiles, how much more will those salvation bring but life from the dead? You think about that. The Jewish rejection of Jesus opened the door for the salvation of the Gentiles. So did they fall so did they stumble so far as to lose salvation? Absolutely not. There's no implication of that whatsoever. He says, he answers the question, absolutely not. If their transgression brought you salvation, how much more will their salvation bring than life from the dead? Remember, I was a natural branch, cut off for unbelief, laying in a pile, waiting to go in the fire. Have I, had I died before 44, when I came to faith, I would have been a branch thrown in the fire. A natural branch, cut off for unbelief, according to Romans 11. It's an explanation I completely understand. You were a wild branch, not on the tree, but grafted into the same tree that I'm picked up and grafted into. I don't go back to the tree of unbelief. I go back to the tree of the commonwealth of Israel and grafted with my Christian brothers and sisters, Gentile brothers and sisters who have come to faith in the same Messiah I believe in. So did you have to convert to believe in the Jewish Messiah? It's a question I get all the time. When did I convert? I said, convert to what? What would I convert to? Why would I leave Judaism? We got the Messiah. Doesn't matter. It's illogical. It's an illogical state. Oh, the conversion of Paul. To what? Did they not go to the synagogue as was their custom? Why would they keep going to the synagogue if they weren't Jewish anymore? Where do they preach the gospel? To the Jew first. That's where they went to the synagogue to preach the gospel. To the lost sheep of the house of Israel. This is in accordance with the commands of God. And Paul's declaration in Romans 1 that says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. I don't think that's a question. That's an order. It's not better. It doesn't say to the Jews better. It just says this is the order. So what do they do? They went to the synagogue, preached the gospel, and then they went after the Sabbath was over. What day of the week was that? They call it Sunday. Okay, in Hebrew, it's Yom Rishon. It's the first day. The first day begins at sundown on Saturday. 
So it's really Sunday evening, then morning, Sunday morning. You go to church on Sunday morning, which is 12 hours after evening. All right? If you go at 10 o'clock in the morning, all right, you're 16 hours from the beginning of the day. You're in the 16th hour of Sunday. You're not in the 10 o'clock hour of Sunday or in the 4 o'clock hour or the 4th hour of Sunday because it starts at 6 o'clock. You're in the 16th hour of Sunday. You pretty much shot most of the day. By the time you get it all together and get back home, you only got a couple hours left on Sunday till it becomes the second day, Monday. That's why in Israel, stores are closed on Saturday, they open on Sunday because of the Sabbath. So you've got to put things in biblical perspective. So Israel will dwell securely in the land forevermore, Ezekiel 39, 26 to 28. Finally, as a direct result of the destruction of Gog and his invading armies, all of Israel is fully restored to the land forevermore. What is that definition? The land. It's Genesis 15. That's the land. It's not what exists today. It's the land. Where did God define the land? Genesis 15. He established the borders of Israel forevermore. That's the land. That's the sovereign land of Israel. So it includes Lebanon, Syria, most of Iraq, all of Jordan, northern Saudi Arabia, northern Egypt. That's all on the biblically mandated borders. If you take a look at the cutout, it's like a parallelogram that sweeps down into northern Egypt, northern Saudi Arabia. So finally, as a direct result of the destruction of Gog and his invading armies, all of Israel is fully restored to the land forevermore. As Old Testament scholar Daniel Block comments concerning this passage, Ezekiel's declaration that not a single individual will be left behind when the Lord restores his people is without parallel in the Old Testament. The Lord's restoration is not only total, however, it is permanent. He promises never again to hide his face from his people. That's why you don't see Messiah leaving. At the end of the thousand-year reign, he doesn't disappear, does he? He finally defeats Satan, throws him into the lake of fire. Then I saw a new temple. I saw the new heaven and the new earth come down. And God, there was no sun and there was no moon because God and Jesus were there. He doesn't leave ever again. The presence of God never leaves ever again. And we've seen the pattern of the presence of God. The presence of God left, entered the first temple, left the first temple upon its destruction did not enter the second temple when Zerubbabel dedicated it, did not enter the second temple when Herod expanded it. It did not enter, the Spirit of God did not enter the second temple until Jesus walked in there at 30 years old. The Spirit of God entered the temple. It was visited when he was a baby, but it left. It took up residence for three and a half years, and then it left and has not returned, will not return until he returns. And the millennial reign begins in the millennial temple. The Spirit of God will never depart. This is the promise of God, and we see it played out in the vision of John at Patmos. So everything that's written supports what was already prophesied. This is the consistency and the errancy of God. He promises it. You know, his pattern is you have a problem. The people of Israel have a problem. He makes a promise. And then he provides for the fulfillment of that promise. It's problem, promise, provision. We live our life that way. We have a problem. We go to the Lord. He makes a promise. We find his promise in the word that this too shall pass like a kidney stone. And then he makes provision for that to happen. We don't know what the time is between the time we have the problem, the time we have the promise, and the time we have the provision. We just know God is faithful. And then the cycle begins again. You have a new problem, and you get a new promise, and you get new provision. That's the same for Israel. They have a problem, God makes them a promise, and then he provides for the fulfillment of that promise. Some of it happens at the end, just in time. So how can anyone place these events before the time when the Antichrist would invade Israel. 
trample upon Jerusalem and many of the inhabitants is simply beyond explanation. The only way these events could properly be properly understood is in the context of the return of Jesus, the destruction of all the enemies of the Lord and his people. Because all of these descriptions can only be applied to the time of the return of Jesus and the establishment of his messianic kingdom, it is impossible that Gog and his armies are anything other than the Antichrist and his armies. This is why he draws this parallel and says that the timing's the same. The person must be the same. Okay? He's going to lead the armies. So he has a new book out, or it's now a year old, uh, Mideast Beast, The Scriptural Case for an Islamic Antichrist. Not only is this prophecy examined in careful detail, but also the massive prophetic implication of Gog as the Antichrist. As he says, within the world of popular biblical prophecy, this absolutely changes everything. It's time to begin working through the dramatic implications. So let's see just you get it and read it. It's a very, very clear proposition that I'll probably have him back on the program again. He's a good friend of the program uh, to talk about this to explore it so that you have a full hour's worth of teaching just from him on this in a discussion where we can take a look at it. So, U.S. Embassy move. Everybody's waiting to hear about what's going to happen with the U.S. Embassy move. All right? So Trump has already said, declared that we will move the embassy. What does he have to do? We talked about this. He doesn't have to do a thing. And the spokesperson... Uh, Rob, uh, Ron DeSantis, a Republican out of Florida, the chairman of the House Subcommittee on National Security, said on Sunday, President Trump would not renew the waiver that establishes the president to postpone, uh, enables the president to postpone implementing the congressional decision to relocate the embassy to Jerusalem. So this was a law. We talked about this. It was enacted in 1995 to be implemented in 1999. And they bought the, they had the property. They already had the property. We pass it. And we'll pass it again when we go to Israel. And we always drive through the same section uh, along uh, Agron Street. And speaking at a, press, at a press briefing at Jerusalem's King David Hotel, uh, he said that I do not think President Trump would sign the waiver, which is due for renewal in May. May will be close to the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Jerusalem. And he expects Donald Trump will, President Trump will let the waiver expire. Ever since Congress enacted the Jerusalem Embassy Act of 1995, the president has the right under Section 7 to sign a semi-annual national security waiver that the chairman of the House Committee on National Security would be aware because this is for, it's the only reason to sign it is because of national security. <clears throat> for some reason, they believe that it would incite an Islamic nation that borders Israel or the Fatah regime, or at that time PLO, under Yasser Arafat, would attack the United States or United States Navy vessels or United States Army installations. So national security just doesn't extend to our borders, it extends to our military as well. So far, all the presidents, Clinton, Bush, and Obama, have held office, who have held office since the measure was passed, have consistently postponed it, relocating the, relocating, postponed relocating the embassy by renewing the waiver. He said that the delegation had visited two possible sites for locating the embassy, the current American consulate at Agron Street in the center of the city in East Talpiot. Uh, he said it seemed that the quickest solution would be to house the embassy at Agron Street, at least temporarily. Hezbollah preparing for war. IDF chief of staff warns Shiite terror group is violating UN resolutions and is arming itself in preparation for the war against Israel. How many read what happened at the UN? We pulled out of our sponsorship of that bill that Obama abstained from that declared Israel as an apartheid government. The resolution was withdrawn and uh, an anti-Israel representative from the Middle East quit their job and Muhammad Abbas presented them with a National Civilian Heroes Award. Okay, for standing up against it. But America's finally putting their foot down in the UN saying we're not going to support an anti-Israel agenda. So this uh, health care bill, this Gorsuch, Gorsuch confirmation hearings, all these things are preventing Congress from voting on things like defunding the UN. So all, all these things are a distraction, and every delay distracts from this agenda of social justice. I would suggest all of you watch the interview with uh, 
Mike Shotwell, he wrote a book called Immersed in Red, Being Raised in a Marxist Household. Did you see it? Isn't it amazing? He was raised in a Marxist household and says that this is the core value system of the Democratic Party. Say the name of the book again. Immersed in Red. I-M-M-E-R-S-E-D in Red. Mike Shotwell. And he gives a dire warning for America afterwards. He says that this entire movement of millennials, this entire movement of leaning left liberals, and he tells you what the methodology is, and it's straight out of the Marxist handbook. Remember we talked about the fact that 28 different groups gathered together, women, 3 million women gathered together in Washington, they didn't have a single agenda, and he goes, well, they shouldn't. The Marxist handbook says you just come and generate confusion. You just generate chaos. As long as you generate chaos, you're doing your job. You don't have to be cohesive. You don't have to be organized. The more disorganized you are, the more chaos you cause, the more unsettling it is, the more you advance your cause of social justice. And everybody becomes the same. Bernie Sanders, he said the best thing that ever happened to America was Bernie Sanders. You could finally say the word socialist. Then you could draw it back to a Marxist ideology for the advancement of making everybody in America the same. And we actually talked about it. That was Hitler's absolute goal was to make every Jew, strip them down, remove humanity from them, and turn them into a thing. But his biggest mistake was his pride. He tattooed the people at Auschwitz and gave them a unique number so that they could record all the information about them before they killed them. So what was supposed to demoralize and strip them of their identity, they had a unique identity. It was the only thing that held sanity together for some people that they were not stripped of all humanity. They weren't turned into a thing. They had a unique number. It was different than the number of the person next to them. It was the only thing they had that was different. They were stripped to taking their clothes. They were stripped of their food. They were thrown out into the cold. They were dehumanized, except for the fact that they had a unique number. And you'll find that most people who are still living that came out of Auschwitz, men especially, will wear short sleeve shirts. They don't hide the tattoo. It's not a badge of honor. It's the one thing that holds them together in being able to recount the memory of what happened to them. That when they put that on and they look back, that they don't lose themselves in it because it was the one thing that they could hold on to. See, Hitler did it because... Scripture commands not to mark your body. He put them in the ovens because the life of a thing is in the blood. So the blood, the lifeblood returns to the ground and can be resurrected. But you burn it, no life in it. It's transformed, it's chemically changed. It's no longer blood, it's carbon. Carbon is a unique element unto itself. It doesn't have any of the characteristics of blood. There's no life in it. It's Death. It's destroyed. It's burned. So he knew that. That's why he wanted to cremate as many Jews as he could, because they couldn't come back. He was not a man that didn't know what the belief system was. He had Jewish advisors that wanted to save their own lives and turn against their own brothers. So, IDF Chief of Staff, Gadi, Gadi Eisenach, Eisenkot, warned Sunday that the Hezbollah terror organization in Lebanon was preparing for its next major attack on Israel and that war with the fundamental Shiite group was only a matter of time. The coming war will have an address the Lebanese government. Hezbollah is violating UN resolutions and is preparing for war. In December 2016, Hezbollah received two portfolios in the Lebanese government and has been photographed using American tanks. Eisenkot added that the IDF was working to prevent Hezbollah from obtaining heavy weapons, intercepting arms shipments to the Iranian-backed group. We will protect Israel's interest and are working to prevent weapons transfers to Hezbollah. In Lebanon, Hezbollah continues its effort to arm itself with deadlier, more precise, small arms for attacks targeting the Israeli front. The declarations coming out of Beirut recently made the address of the future war clear, the state of Lebanon, and the organizations operating under its authority. Recently, reports have claimed that Iran is building weapons factories in Lebanon in order to circumvent Israeli attacks on armed transfers. What's the gain from this? 
Sunnis are running over the world. So what is the one crown and the thorn of Islam? Israel. You take Israel back, which was under Muslim rule, under the Hashemites and all the Muslim conquerors, for how many years? 700 years? 400 years? 700 years? I don't know how long it was. I forget. I hear it every year, but I forget from one year to the next. I'm not a historian and I'm not a numbers guy. So everything to me is 5,000 years. Everything. When that happened? It was either 2,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago. That's my only two answers. You know, when did that happen? Get a Bible timeline. I don't know when it happened. Well, how long, what years were they in the, uh, under Pharaoh? I have no idea. And when you look, it doesn't tell you, does it? It doesn't give you a benchmark for how many years it was. You know it was, they were there 430 years. God prophesied they'd be enslaved for 400 years. It was 30 years that they were with the Pharaoh that knew Joseph. We know how long they were there. We don't know what year they got there and what year they left. And what year that Pharaoh, we think we know which Pharaoh it was. The, uh, I don't know if it was Walk Like an Egyptian or King Tut. I forget which one it was. Because that's the only ones I know. Right? Unless you watch those movies where they come back to the Pharaoh comes back to life. But Hezbollah, Iran's proxy, Shiite. So what's happening in the world? 80% of Muslims are Sunnis. 20% are Shiite. Iran, Lebanon, Pakistan, Afghanistan. These are your Shiite groups. This is where they come from. You take a look at the border countries. Okay? Who borders Afghanistan? Pakistan and India. So, you know, you're looking at the influences. Now we have this crazy man, the guy that did gangman style that runs North Korea. That's what I think about him. He reminds me of that guy that did that song. And he's getting ready to blow up the world. He said, if one bullet is fired, I will nuke America. Like, we don't have anything that will intercept an intercontinental ballistic missile. Well, okay, we'll be afraid. We'll be very afraid. This is the wars and rumors of wars. So this is a rumor of war. We have reports that Iran's building weapons facilities. We know that Gaza, they have weapons facilities. They brought in people that design and manufacture missiles and warheads. We know that Israel has nuclear Capability. We read that report last week that Lebanon had photographs of the nine specific installations where things were done. Name them by name, put them on a map. And Israel's still laughing about it. I say, yes, those are nine of the, we won't tell you how many. So if we have 100, nine's not a big deal. If we have 200, nine's nothing. If we have 500, and we have one in your country, won't you be surprised? So you have no idea how the Israeli mind works and how the Israeli intelligence, Mossad, works. And all over the world, it's the most respected intelligence community that there is. Their security is, their military. They take delivery of F-16s, and then American pilots come over there after they modify them, and learn how to fly them all over again by the Israeli Air Force. Their pilots train our pilots because they make modifications to the F-16 to suit their kind of warfare. And they come and say, wow, we should have designed it that way to begin with. So when you go to Israel, you are incredibly secure because every 18, 19, and 20 year old has a machine gun. Wherever you go, you see young people getting on a bus, 20 or 30 of them, in uniform with their machine guns strapped over their arm. This is a, a deterrent. Israel police drive with their lights flashing all the time. But not odd. Here in America, they hide from you and they sneak up on you and then they turn their lights on, right? Okay. Is that a deterrent? No, they're looking to catch you. In Israel, they're looking to tell you there's 20 of us right around the corner from you. Don't even think about doing something. 
were present all over the place. Everywhere you go, you're seeing these flashing blue lights. Everywhere. All over the place. And you go, why don't they turn their lights off? Because they're not sneaking up on you. They're telling you, we're here. And we'll be all over you. This is why terrorists get shot right away. They might get away with a little something, but they don't walk away from it. Because there's a police, there's somebody right around the corner. And they're very present all over there. And you feel very confident that there's somebody that's watching over you. Right? And you feel that, Gina? Yes. Absolutely. All right, questions, comments, we've hit our time. Did you look something up? Were you supposed to look something up, Charles? What were you supposed to look up? There were two questions. Moscow is in Europe, and the second question was? What's north of Jerusalem? What's due north of Jerusalem? What's that? Due. Due north. Okay? Due north of Jerusalem. Okay. Draw a line due north from Jerusalem. It goes through Moscow. What other powerful nation is north of Israel? None. This is from WND. Let's see if we can pull this up. Well, Wi-Fi is not working. So you'll have to look it up for yourself. Yivarecha Adonai v'yismarecha. Ya'er Adonai panavalecha v'kunecha. Yisa Adonai panavalecha v'yasimlecha shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his countenance toward you and give you his peace. In the name of the Prince of Peace, Jesus our Messiah. Amen and amen, you are dismissed. Shalom.